Hello everybody, welcome to Eternal Brews. My name is Pojo and today we're doing something dumb and something fun and something very, very expensive. Uh, this is Can't Beat Em, Chain Em. This is a deck that I've been working on for a while, but uh, with the uh, addition of Siddhiti, the Killing Steel has uh, congealed into something pretty solid for like a deck to get to Masters with. And uh, we have gotten to Masters with this deck, so I thought we'd share the list and talk about what all we are doing with it. So the idea behind this deck is that we are are trying to cheat out our green influence to play very very early as in as early as turn three or turn four Siddhiti the Killing Steel and very very early as early as turn four or turn six Martyr's Chains. So basically we're just trying to establish very very powerful justice legendaries that give us a lot of control and a lot of sort of like beefy basically like card advantage and value and just use those to win out the game over the course of a long period of time. So let's go ahead and talk over the list and what all we're doing with it. Most of the cards in this list have some synergy with each other, so they work uh, not entirely in a vacuum. So we're going to talk about them in relation with each other. So first things first, we are running Siddhiti Killing Steel and Martyr's Chains, and the objective is to ramp to those cards using temporary ramp effects like Bullet Shaper and uh, End of the Barrel, both of which give a plus two effective power and can be very, very strong in that respect. To that end, we also need to fix a lot of our influence, which means that we need to play particularly cards like Bullet Shaper, but we're also using Horus Traver, the 1-1 one, one for 1 that has summoned get an influence of your choice from the Stranger set. Uh, so yeah, like this is a uh, kind of interesting, cute little thing. It was based off of uh, a couple of different things. We built this kind of like sort of mono justice deck before, and I really like building sort of unique power bases where we play basically a lot of one particular type of power and we try to like really weigh heavily on that influence so that we can take advantage of the of having lots of influence in a single turn. Horus Trapper is one of the best ways to do that because it's the only way on one to develop double influence in a turn and if you've uh, ever been asking about like depleted power that does double influence Horus Trapper is actually that card uh, although most people don't really like to play it because it is a little bit difficult to play if you are not valuing out with the rest of the deck, but we are going to be doing that. So uh, with Horus Traver on one into Bullet Shaper on two, combined with Justice Sigils, Rakano Banners, and Seats of Glory, you can, in fact, attack with Horus Traver, toss a card to Bullet Shaper, and place a DT on turn three, giving you a 6-6 six, six Killing Steel Flying Warp guy with a Curse of Provocation that says if you don't take damage at the end of your turn, then, or at the end of the Cursed Player's turn, then um, you get to draw extra cards, which is very, very handy since you have spent quite a few cards on getting the Horus Trevor Bullet Shaper combo together. But you do have a lot of units on board to uh, block with, which means that you generally get a pretty solid start if you actually get that kind of dream combo. It's not always going to happen. Typically, it's more likely to happen on four than on three, but it is pretty fun to do, so we certainly like that aspect of it. Okay, so that's one thing that we're doing. Another thing that we can do with Bullet Shaper is we can toss cards like Defiance, Torch, and Privilege of Rank to throw out End of the Barrel and then play Martyr's Chains. So on turn four, a Martyr's Chains is just going to be a game ender. There's really no way to recover from that kind of a control blowout. Like if your opponent is really, really hard aggro and you haven't managed to establish a board outside of Bullet Shaper, there's the possibility that they can recover from it. But in general, this is going to be a pretty strong setup because it turns 25 of your power into slaves and turns every single one of your units, including Horus Traver, into unstoppable monsters that will eventually kill you if they are not removed, which means that your opponent has to respond to every single one of your cards with at least one card of their own, and that card has to be pretty hard removal to extremely hard removal in order to get uh, over you in terms of value. Martyr's Chains is an absurd control card. We've talked a lot about like how it is kind of problematic as a control card just because it is so high-end in control that it kind of weighs out all other types of control decks. And both Siddhiti and Martyr's Chains are just amazing top end to get to that allow you to really value out with basically if you had garbage in your deck you would probably be just fine getting these two cards out. So yeah, uh, that's the major combos to the deck. The rest of the deck is just comprised of standard good stuff in Rakano because Rakano does not have a lot of garbage. There's a lot of useful stuff that we can be doing. Our big stabilizer is Rizon Great Bow Master. This is a sheerly Rakano deck, so lifesteal is pretty important. Rizon uh, synergizes very well with Bullet Shaper, who discards 
uh, power, and including privilege of rank, to sort of give us extra spells. And it also synergizes with another card that we're running, Flame Brewer, uh, which is definitely some of our fun of, but also a card that really supports Rezon's strategy of getting five spells into the void, while still allowing us to play a full 30 unit deck and get to all of the other things that we're doing. Flame Brewer will generally pull something that you can throw into the market, or that you can discard to uh, Bullet Shaper, of course, or it can be something that you basically just don't get to play and discard into your void and then get to later use to activate Lifesteal on Rizan. But every once in a while, it'll also pull a useful spell, and that'll allow you to just do things like banish Varas, Varas choice things with weapons on them, throw temple standards, and uh, shift at and phase things out, and do basically all sorts of ridiculous nonsense. Flame Brewer adds a lot of fun and unpredictability to this deck, and it's also just a really reasonable card at four for that particular slot. So we like it here quite a bit. One thing that you can do instead of Flame Brewer or Horus Trapper, if you're trying to play around with things, there is a new Shift 2-1 card. Uh, I don't remember the exact name of it, but it's a 2-1 Grenadin that has uh, basically Shift... No, if I say Shift Grenadin, then we can actually find it. Uh, Stone Hewer, which is also another way to get the ramp combo out. So if you're more, fo more focused on the combo, you can run this card instead. But we're trying to keep this card, this deck fairly well balanced in all aspects. So to that end, we're running Flame Brewer to make sure that we have a decent curve. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, all of our 8 drops happen. We have Zoe of the Endless Horde to give us a couple of extra spells to discard to Bullet Shaper. It's also a decent top end card, and we have a lot of top end because we tend to get to the top end very often, and we want to have Payoffs for End of the Barrel, which is a very, very good ramp card that allows us to play 8 drops a little bit early. Playing a Zoe off of End of the Barrel is usually quite good because Zoe can draw a bunch of those cards that you lose playing End of the Barrel back, and also if you End of the Barrel for free with Warp, that's really, really good value. Uh, we also use Savior of the Meek. This card helps helps us stabilize against aggro. It is really, really solid and can be played with end of the barrel. If you are attacking into an onslaught setup and your opponent decides to block, then you get the tribute and you can end of the barrel for 10, play Savior of the Meek then. It's also a lifesteal card, which means that when it combines with Martyr's Chains, the Watchmen with lifesteal tend to become very, very good at helping you stabilize. And it is, of course, a big flyer itself. And since it creates a card of its own and is just a good card to trade into the market, this is a really solid thing to pair with Red Canyon Smuggler. We have a lot of these cards where you can trade them into Red Canyon Smuggler and still get value, and that kind of like merchant value allows us to help stabilize our early game, which is really, really fun stuff. Uh, beyond that, Privilege of Rank helps us fix power and make sure that we get to everything that we need. Defiance and Torch keep us alive in the early game, and we are running four of each because we definitely need everything that we can get. And in our market, we have Great Kiln Titan to play Martyr's Chains off of the top, as well as all of our big stuff. We have Talut, which can allow us to ramp into some big stuff, as well as activate Martyr's Chains in bad situations. Conflagrate, which is a cheap removal card that gets rid of a small thing if we want to deal with aggro, and also can be useful later on for dealing with very well established aggro by allowing us to deal uh, a to cast for seven and destroy two units, get some value out of it. If we have just a ton of power, we can even cast it three times. That's not going to happen as often, but two for one with Conflagrate is often a game ender and a backbreaker, and we really, really like having that. Boar is, of course, a card that can be traded back into the market, as well as a card that shuts down all relic-based strategies. And Emerald Waystone is the power that we get when we want to activate Martyr's Chains as a kill spell, or when we just really, really need that extra green for Saditi the Killing Steel. So with all of that in mind, this deck is pretty reliable and we're going to show off uh, exactly what we can do with it and just sort of uh, give you an idea of how it goes. Nerf Martyr's Chains, let's go. All right, here we are against Bomb B DK and they are... Yeah, they're a sloth, so we're going to see exactly what they've got going on. Our opener is decently strong. We have some cool stuff going on here. Namely, we can bullet shaper into end of the barrel, which means that we have the opportunity to access some other stuff. Also, two bullet shapers means that we're much more likely to play cards like Saditi, and the crest means that we're more likely to pull power. We are first here. Two power hands on first are not always good, but this one has enough stuff that I feel relatively comfortable with it. So we're going to go ahead and keep it. Um, basically, like the chance of getting another two power hand is still 33%, so, and that hand is very likely to be less good than this one. So I think we're going to go ahead and dig. We're going to try and find power, and if we find Privilege of Rank, I think we're still happy because we can Bullet Shaper, play Privilege of Rank, and then play the second Bullet Shaper, and that'll get us to three pretty easy. So yeah, that looks very, very comfy. Play a time there into an Initiative Sands. So we know our opponent is trying to ramp. 
uh, if they decide to play a ramp into a Marin Stinger, we will have Bullet Shapers to block, which is great. Another round. So we will go ahead and do this. Discard here. Unfortunately, we pulled two end of the barrels, Another which is round. generally the weakest that our hands can get. If we have two end of the barrels, we're not likely to be able to play both of them. End of the barrel is definitely a market card that we much prefer to have in the market than elsewhere. But we've got our defiance here, so we're not worried about card draw or anything too crazy happening. Uh, I'm pretty comfy blocking here. I don't want to attack, and uh, yeah, overall looking pretty strong. We can actually play Razon here, kill one of these 1-1s one and get ourselves started, and that would allow us to set up some other interesting options. I'm already at 5 green, so I can place the DT whenever I feel like it, and Defiance here, yeah, that's going to be pretty strong. You will pay for your crimes. So if we really need to activate Rizan in a pinch, we can always throw both of our end of the barrels just as cards, which uh, certainly not the best thing on my mind. I think what we're going to do here is we're just going to toss this out. Oh, I could attack first if I wanted to play Savior of the Meek instead of Rizan Great Bow Master. Getting a 7-7 out this early would be okay, but I think I'm much more interested in actually saving the second one for a Martyr's Chains later on, and just playing Razan right now, killing the 3-3, and keeping ourselves well set up against any sort of, like, shenanigans with, um, you know, any sort of nonsense that we might have to deal with. Uh, let's go ahead and attack with just one of these guys. We'll get a little pressure in, maybe trade with a Granadin or two. Obviously, this deck wants to play Xenon Obelisk, so we're happy taking trades because, yeah, the Obelisk will come down. Okay, the attacks here don't look great. Uh, there's nothing really good that we can do here. I do have a second end of the barrel that I can play later on to cast Savior of the Meek or do something interesting. But the Bullet Shapers are keeping everything at bay until such time as the Initiates come out. So we're going to take some damage here, but we're going to be alive for the foreseeable future. Sakalas is definitely pretty rough. Can't say that I love that. The attack here kind of makes sense. If I want to swing, I can get a bunch of damage in. Uh, and then the crackback is just really bad. I kind of like the idea of attacking for two here and just trading with one of the Grenadins. Um, I think that's got some potential to it. Let's see what we can do. It's possible we won't get the blocks. I mean, our opponent is perfectly happy to do other stuff here, but I don't know. I pretty much suspect that they will take that triple block. Despite uh, them knowing that we have end of the barrel. So now we get to end of the barrel. And play Savior of the Meek. So we outplayed our opponent a little bit there, and now we have a 7-7 lifesteal with a 5-4 lifesteal, which is 13-12 damage, actually. But um, good enough, and uh, our opponent is now quite dead, so happy stuff. <laughs> okay. All right, here we are up against someone whose name I can't pronounce. Uh, I think we are definitely going to redraw this. One power is never what we're looking for. Uh, we proved in last game that we could definitely play this whole hit deck out and win without Siddhiti or Martyr's Chains, which is very important. Um, but yeah, now we're going to see if we can actually manage to get that combo off. This time around, uh, this power is probably good enough. Privilege of Rank is decent here, so we're, we've got a reasonable chance of actually getting to what we want. I'm not super fond of going first with this hand, but I think we'll be okay. And as long as we hit a power in the next couple of turns, we should be pretty good. We've got a couple draws to get to it. Um, and I think the, the mulligan was gonna be worse. So, okay. Nothing great there. This is pretty unfortunate. Torch would allow us to defiance the 0-2, but that's not anything I'm after. Abduct can get Razan into the void, which, yeah, I'm not super fond of that. They might actually go for our Red Canyon Smuggler. That seems like it would be pretty sensible as well. Okay, but we do get to play Privilege of Rank here, so as long as our opponent is playing kind of slow and dirtily, we should win the day, because Martyr's Chains and our general top end is just going to be better than whatever it is that they're running. On the other hand, this deck does rot Madness, and Madness is one of the serious weaknesses of a Martyr's Chains deck. If we're not well enough established on health, then Madness can really blow out with Martyr's Chains just because of the exponential nature of that card. So that's something that we have to keep an eye on and make sure that we don't get blown out by. Defiance in particular is going to be really helpful in that regard. Okay, um, right here I've got End of the Barrel coming up. I've got a torch in hand. I'm not in any particular hurry. We can play slowly. We can just sort of like get things going, you know, at whatever speed we feel like. Most of my cards have flying, so even if I play Razan, I might actually shoot face as opposed to shooting the Slumbering Stone. Uh, we're going to force our opponent to sacrifice that and thus like not spend a lot of effort on it. 
Dark Wisp, another card that we don't really care about all that much. We can take damage here, we don't really need to worry about it. As long as the opponent is just trying to draw cards, then yeah, we'll just play play what we can. The one nice thing about Defiance or Torching here right now is that we could potentially activate Lifesteal on Razan, and that's a big deal. But this deck still hasn't actually like thrown anything at us that we can really deal with, so... Alright, got Defiance, got another Torch. This is all looking a little rough. Um, I'm okay taking the damage here. We can stun this, but there's not a lot of point at the moment. Tend the Flock. Tend the Flock's an interesting choice. There must be a Champion of Cunning in this deck? Third Defiance in a row. <laughs> okay, so we're having a bit of an awkward day. I'll just take it. I could Defiance again, but once again there's actually nothing to kill, so we're fine. All right, and our Fire Sigil. So Saditi so will be playable soon. Uh, Razan seems like something that we can definitely like pop the face Aegis on for. Let's not worry about what the tokens are doing. We're just going to try to make sure that uh, our opponent doesn't draw the card that they most want to draw, which is Champion of Cunning. And beyond that, I think we're okay. Attack for five here. Easy peasy. Not even anything fun happening there, so we'll just go for another Razan. Name, you will be judged. And that gets us another blocker. Um, we have End of the Barrel, so we can play Martyr's Chains when we need it. Uh, our opponent finally gets a Devour, which is the card that we're most worried about, since that's the card that actually allows them to get into Champion of Cunning, and also have other scary answers, like, uh, of course, Madness. So we're, we're not super happy about this. Felm is generally a pretty tough matchup, but... I think we might still be able to pull it out. Uh, I do have Defiance here against Xenon Lifespeaker, so that's a really interesting possibility for us. Torch is potentially going to get us a little bit of extra damage. We're currently pushing with 10, so the more damage that I can do, the better. Um, and Saditi, of course, is generally pretty good here. Uh, this looks pretty strong. We're going to go ahead and attack in. Didn't get anything crazy happening there. So Horus Traver gets us one Justice. And Saditi plays our Curse of Provocation. So now we've got three good flyers. I still have a block on Memory Dredger, and like my overall position is looking pretty strong. We see another Devour here, so this is going to turn into potentially a Madness. We don't want to let our opponent draw any more cards, so like they're probably going to prevent us from drawing, but that's okay. As long as we are like at least staying stable, I think we're fine. More Tend the Flux is really interesting. I'm very curious what the overall plan with the Tenda Flux is. I feel like this must be a Champion of Cunning deck, and it just hasn't drawn Champion of Cunning. Uh, it's a decently strong idea, especially with the new Feln Insignias. Like, those actually make the deck a lot more viable. Um, but, uh, or just, is Feln one of the Insignias? I guess that's something we have to check out. Uh, yeah, like, next turn we have a Torch on the 2-2, two -two, and then from there, I think we have Lethal. So, thankfully our opponent did not hit Champion of Cunning. Martyr's Chains is, of course, lovely here, and I'm trying to decide if we want a Martyr's Chains here or if we want a Torch. Martyr's Chains might actually be a little unsafe. Let's Torch first. And that attack leads into 11 points of damage. I don't want the Crackback to be like a big Madness Crackback is the main thing. So we get that block. Oh, actually, the block on the 6-6 six, six is better, yeah. I'll crush you. And I'm not going to play Crest of Glory, because End of the Barrel into Martyr's Chain's Crest of Glory gives us an immediate kill spell against anything other than Champion of Cunning, which hopefully our opponent has this turn. I guess we'll find out. Dark Return, Memory Dredger. Okay, we're okay against that. The card did not get screamed, so we're okay on that front. It's got lifesteal right now, which is pretty rough, but we're still going to be pretty stable. And the Witching Hour, okay. Tend the Flock Witching Hour, that does make a lot more sense. Okay, well we can just Defiance this so we don't have to worry about that part. You will pay for your crimes. Since we left out our whole end of the barrel setup, I think we're going to be okay. 
And yeah, <laughs> our opponent didn't wait for us to end the barrel into Martyr's Chains, but we did have that available to push the remaining lethal. Um, I feel like my opponent could have held out there for a little bit, but yeah, you know, they they were going to probably lose that turn. So nonetheless, a very strong game and a pretty good representation of the deck as a whole. All right, here we are up against Lynx, and opener's got Sea to Glory, Sea to Glory, Fire Sigil, Bullet Shaper, Martyr's Chains, and a Zoe. So, like, everything in here is really, really good. We got a decent amount of power. We get to generate at least four very quickly. So end of the barrel off the top is pretty strong. Zoe actually gets us a card to discard to Bullet Shaper, so we can feasibly do the turn four Martyr's Chains, and at the very least we have Flame Brewer and some other stuff to set up Bullet Shaper for later. So this seems very strong. Bullet Shaper is usually always a good indicator of an early hand. Uh, sometimes the hand just doesn't have enough power and it's not worth playing, but oh, there's the end of the barrel, so now we've got the full combo. It's a Bullet Shaper, discard the Treasure Trove on four, end of the barrel, and we're good to go. So. Crest of Glory here. We're going to play that first because we need undepleted power to get the combo, and we might as well play the Bullet Shaper on three when it's a little bit less likely to get killed. Defiance seems good here. I'm pretty happy to have it, and honestly, like, seems pretty comfy. Rhyme Conclave Smuggler, not terribly unlikely. The thing I gotta worry about here is Valkyrie Enforcers are super common in this deck. We do have decent tools to deal with Valkyrie Enforcer. Like, I'm gonna be playing good value into that like every turn after this, so if they play Valkyrie Enforcer into Bullet Shaper, it's not the end of the world. But I would prefer to not get murdered by a Valkyrie Enforcer here. Alright, that attack is pretty strong indicator of an onslaught. We'll see what it is. It was not an onslaught, so now we do the thing. Julie, do the thing. Treasure Trove, end of the barrel, Martyr's Chains. Cool. And now end my turn. And everything I own will now just double every turn for the rest of my days. Or until Rhyme Conclave Smuggler gets a um, vision of austerity. <laughs> Okay, Svetch's Sanctum was not the card that Rhyme Conclave Smuggler was looking for, I think. Red Canyon Smuggler gets us a power here, and that's a pretty powerful option, so I think we'll go with that. Just grab that Emerald Waystone, play the power, kill the Rhyme Conclave, and attack for four. The cleaner the board, the faster this ends. The faster this ends, like, the better off we are, I think. In general, we want to give our opponent as little time as possible to get to their second Rhyme Conclave Smuggler, and as much power as possible on board, because basically, like, if we're getting the doubling off of Martyr's Chains, then shutting down the Relic alone won't do the best job. Okay, another Bullet Shaper can throw a Zoe pretty soon. I think we'll go ahead and wait on that and just play Flame Brewer instead, because spells are fun. Um, we could do Bullet Shaper, discard Defiance, and play Flame Brewer to get, like, a really, really impressive board. But then I'd be making myself more vulnerable to harsh roll, and I think I'd rather not do that. I mean, I'm pretty good on value here. Like, we definitely have, like, we got the full four, turn four combo, so, like, even harsh roll is not going to be great here. The 5 5 off of Svetch's Sanctum isn't really a big deal. Bullet Shaper here feels pretty strong, and Privilege also feels strong. We can play Zoe next turn off of Bullet Shaper, and that's definitely something good for us. So play the Justice, even though I can't actually kill anything with Martyr's Chains. And then next turn we will Defiance and uh, get ourselves a Zoe. The Emerald Incarnations are 3 cost, so they do die to Defiance, which is useful to know. I'm actually a little uncertain if I want to Defiance here. Oh, well, now that we have Privilege and Rank, we definitely do. So get all of our Justice Sigils now. <laughs> Play the one that kills the Sanctum. Attack for four. More harsh rules may be inbound, but if they aren't, then Zoe is definitely going to draw us out of this game. Um, I have plenty of good stuff here, so we should be uh, pretty well valued out. Okay, Wisdom, that's not gonna, gonna, gonna get a harsh rule. And of course, Zoe can blow that thing up. So I've got at least 20 points of damage here, which is enough. Opponent's going to need at least a Vanquish to kill Zoe here. And even with the Vanquish, we get another 8 points of damage across. Savior of the Meek. Okay, so... 
don't really want to play the power here. I think I want to hold on to it and use it to just mess up our opponent later on. I think we're going to instead just go for straight face. We could play the power to draw four cards instead of three. But I think this is actually better value. Push all the damage that we can. We get stunned, but we draw three cards in the meantime. Okay. And we'll hold the treasure troves and the power. We're going to try to play this very, very value-oriented. 16-24 and a 2-2. Two, two. Got a stunned 24-24. Every spell that my opponent plays is a unit, but every power that I play is a slay, so that's not going to work out for very long. Granite Waystone looks great. That actually fills up the board again. I think we'll probably be fine on our current board, so we'll play a Justice Sigil here to kill the 4-4. Four -four. Attack for 16, see if there's another Defiance in there. There is, so our Bullet Shaper is dead. You will pay for your crimes! But Treasure Trove draws us a card, as do our other Treasure Troves. Uh, Razan can actually kill more than just that 1-1, one -one, but I think I'm pretty comfy getting the 1-1. One -one. So we have a 10-8 in the air and a 48-48 in the air. That seems like a pretty good start. Wisdom here, not doing much. Looks like uh, another 3-3. Three -three. I've got Treasure Troves, as always, and Granite Waystone will kill the 3-3, three -three, which will... Not do anything, actually. Like, we're we're perfectly happy on our current position, so... This is another harsh roller bust, and our opponent can't deal with it. That's just generally the way of it. Doesn't matter what control cards you have. <laughs> it is Martyr's Chains. Alright, that's it for today. If you want to see a version of this deck with a little less Horus Trevor and Flame Brewer, both of which are admittedly silly cards, I think they fit the deck theme very, very well. But here's an alternate option with Embargo Officers and Stone Hewers in that particular setup. So we still have one Horus just to make sure that we get a little bit of that fixing in. But this allows us to have the more frequent onslaughts for Saditi, shut down markets and voids, and occasionally get that combo a little bit more often using Stone Hewers shift ability to get that uh, guaranteed like seven power into end of the barrel on turn five which can be really really handy if you want to make sure that you get a, a decent effect off of that combo mix and match as you like feel free to play around with this deck as you like we are nowhere near done with ideas for dark frontier so there's a lot of fun stuff that we'll be doing in the future and i am looking forward to it feel free to like or subscribe if you are down for that and thank you guys once again so much for watching See you next time.